Let's take a Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll uh, get into the Word of God. We'll get into prayer. We're dealing with the mediator, and um, we're going to look at, it's, like I say, it's been two weeks since I was here on a Wednesday, and um, I really don't remember what I said two weeks ago, but the good part about that is you don't either, so if I cover it again, you don't care. What I preached on two weeks ago? Uh, good. I'm going to do it again. Uh, no, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of get more in depth, especially in the book of Hebrews, concerning the office of the mediator and what the Bible says it's for. I was able to preach this out in Kenya and different places, very well received, and um, the people are thankful, just as we are and we should be, that we have someone who will speak in our place to God, and we also have someone who will speak in God's place to us, and it's the same man. Same office, and that, that man is Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 3, verse 22, uh, it mentions Jesus Christ in the previous verse, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would guide us as we open up your word. Thank you, Lord, for what it is, what it says what it means. Lord, enlighten our minds and our hearts. Father, you know I have a very heavy heart today, and you know why. And Father, I pray for my brethren and my sisters. The devil loves to sow discord. He loves to sow division. He loves to uh, lead people astray, lead them away from what's in the Word of God. And Father, we know that there is a strong delusion coming. And the, that is a work in progress. I can see it. Even the pastors out in Kenya could see it. And I pray, Father, that you would take all of those who are yours. And Lord, I, all of us have been in the wilderness at one time or the other. Where we didn't have things quite right. But Lord, you did that for a reason. Because as you pulled us out of the wilderness, you put us in Canaan land. And it literally is a land flowing with milk and honey. It's the milk of the word. It's the honey of the word, sweeter than honey. And uh, so, Father, I pray, dear God, for uh, those who get caught up, those who get led astray, those who uh, believe the deceivers out there, God, that you would be faithful and merciful to them as you have been to me and many others. And God, that after a time of being in the wilderness, you would call us out and teach us your truth so that we will know that there is a God in Israel and we'll know who he is. Father, bless and honor your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said. Now turn to the book of Hebrews, if you would please. Um, Hebrews chapter, let's see here, where do I want to go? Uh, chapter 8, Hebrews 8 and 9. Um, this deals specifically with... Jesus in the office of mediator. Um, there, the Bible says um, there's one mediator between God and men, the man. That's First Timothy chapter 2. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And this is very, very important to remember, especially in these days. Because with with man-made religion, you always have an earthly substitute for Jesus. The truth of it is, the Roman Catholic Church refers to the Pope of Rome as the Vicar of Christ. What that means is, they believe that the Pope is the replacement for Jesus Christ on this earth. That's a lie. It's not true. You don't need someone standing between you and Jesus. What you need is someone standing between you and God the Father, or he'll kill you. And so we have that mediator. But with man's man-made doctrines, man-made religions, uh, doctrines of devils, seducing spirits and whatnot, then man will always put himself in the place of Christ so instead of you going to Christ with your sins, the religion tells you to go to this man with your sins. 
And I'm not about to go to any man with any of my sins. And you, and you don't have to. So there is one God, one man, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. The Bible says, now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Paul was always like a lawyer in a courtroom. And he's always, he gives out evidence. He lays out his case. And then he's going to give a summation. That is a legal term. That when a lawyer has presented his case, he gets the opportunity at the end of the case, either before the judge or the jury, and he's going to give a, his summation of what he believes this case is all about. So he's going to summarize the facts that have been presented. He's going to have an opportunity to tear down the lies that may have been told from the other side. And he, he is going to leave his conclusions then in the hands of the judge or the jury for them to make the decision. Well, tonight you are the jury. The summation now is going to be given to you of everything that Paul said in Hebrews 1 through 7. Now he's going to summarize what he said in, in a few short chapters. This is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That matches what we just read in 1 Peter chapter 3. Jesus, who is now gone to be in heaven is at the right hand of his father. And Hebrews 8, 1 says the same thing. He said on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And so now Hebrews 8 is going to tell you what he's doing there. He is, in verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary. What sanctuary? Not the Jerusalem temple, not the tabernacle in the wilderness, and definitely not the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, the uh, any kind of earthly tabernacle or earthly temple. Jesus, if there's all these little fake tabernacles and fake temples, there is one true tabernacle. And Christ is the mediator uh, in that. He's the minister and the high priest in that tabernacle. Uh, Hebrews 7 if you go back to you, do your own study on this, Hebrews 7 establishes the doctrine that Christ, being a high priest of God's religion, did not come from the priestly tribe of Levi. Christ was not born a Levi. Moses was, Aaron was. And so the Aaronic priesthood comes by way of the tribe of Levi. But Jesus did not come from Levi. He came from a different tribe. He came from Judah, who was born after Levi. And you go through the law and you'll see nothing that pertains uh, concerning the priesthood that pertains to Judah. There's not a law of Moses that, that says Judah is the real priesthood line. It's not there. So there is a, a different covenant now being spoken of. Not the Mount Sinai covenant. The Mount Sinai covenant had a Levite for a mediator. A minister of that covenant. The heavenly Jerusalem covenant has a different mediator and a different minister or administrator of that covenant. That's what the word minister literally means. Uh, in Kenya and England, different um, countries around the world, they do not call their, um, their chief executive a president. They have a prime what? Minister. That does not mean that he's wearing a, a priest robe or has a, you know, a funny hat on or anything like that. That means he is an administrator, an executive of the laws and the statutes of those people. He's the chief executive. Christ then, as minister, is the administrator of this covenant, which means that Christ then is in charge of of how the covenant pertains to each individual life, he and he alone is its arbitrator, its mediator, its administrator. Christ has not placed that responsibility upon any earthly priesthood. Roman Catholic Church does not call its ministers uh, preachers or even pastors. They're priests. 
Why? It's because they believe that the earthly men have been handed the office of administrator of God's covenant. But it's not true. If you've ever had to go to a lawyer and a lawyer representing, let's say, your mom, your dad, your, your rich uncle or whatever... That, that lawyer has the last will and testament of whoever it is. They are the executor and they are the administrator of the, the last will and testament of somebody that's deceased. In other words, the deceased person has already in advance placed somebody in charge of the will to make sure that who is supposed to get what gets what. You remember, who remembers Howard Hughes? Howard Hughes, when he died, left at least two or three different wills. And then even that, there was people coming out of the woodwork saying that they were promised the fortune of Howard Hughes because he said they could have his fortune. And it went on for years, drug out in the courts, because various people were making claims to Howard Hughes' inheritance. There can only be one administrator, one executive, one executor, executor. There can only be one, and that one is Jesus Christ. He and he alone decides who qualifies and who doesn't. So let's say that um, my mother, let's say my mother struck it rich, and all of a sudden she's got... $10 billion in her bank account, and she passes on. So, hopefully she wrote it all up in a will that I get everything and Melissa gets nothing. No, I, I think she did. But chances are, there would be somebody coming out of the woodwork saying, well, Judy Hogger was my mom too. No, there's only one. There's only one mediator, one executor, one will, one covenant, and Christ is the one who decides who gets what. That's what that word means, the minister. He's a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Moses pitched the wilderness tabernacle, not Jesus. Solomon built his temple, not God. Um, they rebuilt the temple after the dispersion, and then later on, it was partially destroyed and then rebuilt by Herod. But God had nothing to do with those buildings. They were not his real tabernacle, not his real temple. The real tabernacle of God is the one that God built or the tent that Jesus himself pitched and not men. Because God does not live where? In temples made with hands. He will not dwell there. So the true tabernacle, number one, there's one in heaven. And number two, it's your body. That's the true tabernacle. And Christ is the only one who is allowed to be the administrator of God's covenant. Verse 3, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For saith, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Verse 6, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by which also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Um, boy, my mind wants to run all over the place, and I'm going to kind of, kind of focus here a little bit better. But anyway, the, the better promises and the better covenant are, have nothing to do with Mount Sinai. They have everything to do with Jesus and a new contract, a new covenant, a new testament and Christ, not Moses, is the administrator of that covenant. So, verse, uh, let's see, verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. 
But the first covenant, what was the fault and the flaw of the first covenant? What was its primary flaw? Huh? Its flaw was us. I mean, the covenant was good if we could keep it. But there isn't a way that human flesh can keep that covenant. For all of sin to come short of the glory of God. The second covenant is better. Because while you may not be able to perfectly um, keep the law. You can believe what God said. So that's the better covenant and the better promises. And the first covenant, the only fault with the first covenant is that it was made with our flesh. And even though you may have said, God, get me out of this problem and I'll never sin again. God knows better than that. And so God, God says, you know, I'm going to get you out anyway. I'm going to save you anyway. But I'm not asking you nor expecting you to be perfect and not ever sin again because I know that that's not going to happen. What I am going to ask of you is, will you trust me all the days of your life? Will you lean on me? So verse 8, for finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Write down Jeremiah 31, 31, if you do not have that reference in your Bible. That's Jeremiah 31, 31. This is where he's quoting from. So, and I like this. The old covenant actually had a clause in it. And the clause was... In case you cannot keep the first covenant, I will establish a second one, a better one, one that you can keep. It's not going to be like the one that I offered everybody at Mount Sinai. In this one, I'm not going to say don't sin and then expect you not to sin. What I'm going to say is I'm going to forgive all your sins. That's what he said in Jeremiah 31. So he said, uh, I, verse 8 again, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. God said it right here. Here's why I have a clause in here that allows for a better covenant. It's for the condition that Israel doesn't keep the first covenant covenant and they didn't so God had it included in the first covenant a fail safe a fail safe a um, what do they call it um, not a security blanket but safety net thank you very much it's like uh, nowadays because cars are so expensive um, when Lisa and I got married, you never took out a six-year car loan. Four was all you wanted to do because the car wasn't going to be worth nothing after four years. Now we're getting into seven- and eight-year car loans, and now they're offering insurance, which is a safety net, which says if you wreck this car and total it out before you end up paying it off, the insurance company will pay off the entire loan for you and you're free from that debt because you don't want to be paying another three years on a car you don't even own anymore because you busted it up or somebody else did it for you. So that's a safety net. And the safety net with the old covenant is Jeremiah 31. God says, here's the safety net. I'm going to give you a new, better covenant. And it's going to be perfect. And I am, I am going to forgive all of your sins. I'm going to wipe them all away. So, verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be my people. Isn't that interesting? There's four things here. He said, I will put my laws in their mind, write them in their hearts, I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. In verse 11, They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. It's like, do you know what the Bible says in Habakkuk? Yes, I know Habakkuk by heart. I can quote every word of it. 
I mean, I can't do that now. But when God fulfills this, we'll be able to quote the whole Bible. Start to finish, backwards, forward, slant ways. No matter how, we will have it in our hearts and we won't have to have anybody teach us God's laws. We'll know them. We'll know who Meher Shalal Hashbaz was. Did I catch you sleeping? Do you know who Meher Shalal Hashbaz is? No! But when you get to heaven, you're going to. And you'll know how to say it right. Amen. Verse 12. Look at verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. What are the conditions for that? What conditions now is God laying out here whereby he will remember their iniquities no more? There are no conditions. There's no payment. There's no works. There's no 20 years straight Sunday school attendance for this. Nothing. You just believe what God said. You trust in what God said. And God said, I'm going to wipe all your sins away. I'll remember them no more. Verse 13. Look at verse 13. And there's a lot here in verse 13. In that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old. What's he doing with us, Sterling? What's God doing with us right now? Making us old. This flesh represents the first covenant. As the first covenant gets older and older, so our bodies get older and older and older. But there is an exception. There is an inner man, a new man, in us, who does not get older. He is renewed every day. Just like God's mercy are new every day, the inner man is renewed daily so that he never wears out, never gets old. New car smell from here to eternity. Amen? Um, baby skin from here on out. Wouldn't you just love to have baby skin again? Okay? Now, and so in a new covenant, he hath made first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And this is our life. We are all but ready to vanish away. But when we do, we will become the instantaneous inheritors of the fulfillment of that new covenant. We already have it by acceptance. But we don't have the fullness of it yet. It's like the, the title sons of God. We already have the title of God's sons. But we don't have the body that goes with it yet. But if you wait, it'll be worth waiting for. Will it not? It'll be worth waiting for. So now chapter 9, verse 1. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first Wherein was the candlestick and the table. So picture in your mind, you're walking from east to west. You go into the sanctuary. On the right, which is north, is the table of showbread. On the left is the candlestick where the seven lamps are, the seven candlesticks, which are the seven spirits of God. Here's what's interesting. Suppose Moses, or let's suppose Mrs. Moses, decided that she was sick and tired of seeing that table on the right side and decided it's time to move the furniture around. I'm tired of this. Look at here, it's rubbing a hole in the sand. Let's move the table somewhere else. She can't do that. Moses can't do it. Aaron, the high priest, can't do it. Now, don't you think about it. You're walking in as the priest. You're walking into the sanctuary. God is represented as the pillar of cloud in the most holy place in the Ark of the Covenant. And what is it that's on the right side of that sanctuary? Huh? What's on the right side of that sanctuary? The table of showbread. Where is Jesus right now? Right now side the north 
That's where he is. So Moses had to put it there and put it there every single time they packed up camp and moved and set camp back up again. Table has to go on the north side every single time. Um, he said, see, thou do it the way I showed it to you. Verse 6. But now hath he obtained... Oh, no. I'm Chapter 9. Just forget about me. The candlestick, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Verse 3. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Not the holy of holies. That's not what it says. Holiest of all or most holy. Because holy of holies, grammatically in English, does not mean much to us. We don't understand that phrase, holy of holies. We do understand most holy place, and we do understand holiest of all. Because that's where God is. He's not in a secondary or something way down the grade of holy. He is Always in the most holy place. The most high place. That's where God always is to be found. Uh, and then verse 4, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. He's talking about what's inside the ark was... Aaron's rod that budded. If you don't know that story, read it. It's a good story. The pot of manna. There was a, God, the first time they saw manna, Moses scooped some of it up, put it in a pot, and set it inside the Ark of the Covenant. Now, every single day, when the Israelites went out and gathered manna, if they had any left over at the end of the day, what happened to it the next day? It rotted. And bread worms and stank. But the manna that was set inside the Ark of the Covenant stayed pure, never corrupted. That's because that manna is the Word of God, and the Word of God never corrupts, never stinks, never breeds worms. Amen. Verse 5, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year. He's talking about the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was. No high priest had a right to go into that chamber. Only the high priest, and he was not allowed at all times to go into that place. He was only allowed to go in one time on one day of every year, and that's it. And even at that, he's got bells on the bottom of his garment. Why? So they can tell whether the dingling is still alive or not. Amen. If he's in there moving around and they can hear them bells ringing. We're in good shape. But if the high priest violated the law concerning that one day of atonement. And God killed him for being in his presence. Unclean. Not even the Jews could rush in there. The paramedics, the fire department, they could not rush in there and grab them. Pulled him out. That's how, that's how serious God is about his ways. Amen? So when you hear people say, well, it doesn't matter how we do this as long as we do it. According to God, it matters how. It matters how. If it's in the book, you got to follow the book or you're going to die. That's how serious God was about it. So the high priest goes in once a year. On the Day of Atonement, offers one blood offering, one time a year, every year. Um, 
Let's see here. Verse 7 again. The second went to the high priest alone once every year, not, with, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Verse 8. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Only one person, one day out of every year, was allowed to go in there. And everybody else, including all the rest of the Levite priests, they had to just kind of wonder what it was like to be in there. Because the way in there was not made manifest. What is he talking about? He's talking about Christ. When Christ said, I am the way, this is part of what he meant. If you want to reach God, and you want to confess your sins to God, there's only one way for you to do so. And that is to go through the one mediator who has provided a way for you to enter into the most holy place. Because without Christ, if you walk in there, you're as good as dead. And rightfully so. So, uh, while well, the first uh, verse, verse nine which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Remember what baptism was all about. Baptism of the Spirit cleans our conscience. We know we sinned. We still remember the sin. But we also know that Christ's blood has blotted out those transgressions now we have a clear con we have a new conscience. And what he's saying is the Old Testament laws could not ever clear a man's conscience because it could never do away with sin. Dispensationalists, hyper dispensationalists, and there may be other groups who say this. They will say that God saved Israel by Old Testament priesthood and Old Testament sacrifices. That's not true. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away their sins. And it never did. It was a foreshadowing. So what, what, what was it saying? It was saying that something that has never sinned had to pay the price for those that do. Lambs and goats and bullocks cannot sin. Why? God never gave them a commandment. God never gave them. God never told a lamb, if you don't eat all the grass, I'm going to kill you. You're a sinner. You'll go to hell. God never made a covenant or a commandment to animals. Therefore, animals cannot sin. And so they are a foreshadowing of a lamb who never sinned. Never broke God's law. And that's all they were. They never took away anybody's sins. So, verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. The time of reformation is now. The reformation refers to a new covenant based upon new promises administered by a new mediator. So God is now going to reform his entire system of saving mankind and giving them forgiveness of their transgressions. And that time of reformation began when Christ died. Then when he rose again, it's all figured into that. So it is, it is imposed on them to do all those things until Christ. Christ brought in the reformation the new covenant the better covenant better mediator better promises verse 11 but christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. So, 
And now you may, I'm going to say this again, it may tire you, but I promise you, we have people in areas in Kenya that are hearing me say this that need to hear it because their priest told them that only the priest could forgive their sins. And you had to go through the priest to get forgiveness of sins. That is not what God said. God said it was by his own blood that he entered in one time into the holy place and he obtained eternal redemption for us for all time, forevermore. How many times does Christ have to die on the cross? Only once. So the Catholic Church then holds power over its people, telling them Christ must re-die every time they sin. And we're the ones who have to re-crucify him again for you or you cannot have your sins forgiven. It's both about power and it's about money. Remember, uh, I've used this illustration before. If a guy is selling holy hamburgers... And he says, if you eat this holy hamburger for this next week, you'll be without sin. And if you died this week, you'll get to go to heaven. If you eat this hamburger and this hamburger costs $350. But you have to keep coming back every week to eat another one because it only lasts seven days. And once seven days are up, you have to buy another one. Or if you die that way, you're going to hell. So number one, they're holding power over the people, telling them they have to keep coming back. And number two, they're getting a lot of money out of them by selling salvation. So then I come along across the street and I set up a hamburger stand of holy hamburgers. And I say, I'm going to give you a hamburger and all you have to do is eat it one time. Well, how much does it cost? It's free. How can you do that? My father made me rich. And I can make hamburgers for each and every human being on the planet and never run out of money. So the hamburger that I'm going to give you is free of charge. And all you have to do is eat it once. And you'll have everlasting salvation. So I'm giving away the holy hamburger. They're selling one a week every week to sinners. So when I move in the neighborhood, the people who are making all this money... How do they feel about me? We're going to kill him. We're going to get him out of our neighborhood. We cannot have him given away for free what we're selling. They will not tolerate that. They will not put up with that. That's why they came to our radio station. They don't want me telling their people that they don't need the Catholic priest. And that Christ's salvation is free. So you don't have to pay the Pope. If you don't want to. That's why they hate me and this church and this Bible and the real Jesus. Make sense? Yeah. Amen. Um, verse 13. For the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of the heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. Verse 15. Here it is, and you underline this. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Jesus is the administrator of a better covenant. That if Jesus says, excuse me, sir, but I happen to have your name on a list of people... And I'm going to offer you an inheritance that will make you a king for all of eternity in heaven. And it's free. That's Jesus' work. Now, his position. That's what he's mediating. That's what he's administrating. Um, verse 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the, te the death of a testator. The testament is not in force until when? The old guy dies, 
or whoever it is. Okay? You cannot receive the inheritance until the death of the testator. Once his death has been accomplished, then you can receive that inheritance. So, verse 17, for a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. In other words, the first testament was dedicated with blood. Moses stood with the book. And he took the hyssop, dipped it in the blood, and he sprinkled the book. And he sprinkled the people. And he said, this blood now joins you in contractual agreement through this contract with God. And it was a temporary book, and it was temporary blood, a temporary contract. Christ's blood is eternal. He is an everlasting mediator. So Christ's blood now sanctifies the book. It is fallen upon us to sanctify and cleanse us, joining us in contractual agreement with God. And because the both the book the mediator and the blood are everlasting, so then is the inheritance everlasting. Again, how many times does Jesus have to die for your sins? One time. Uh, let me finish this real quick. Verse 19, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, uh, and according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. Um, I want to read, I want to get to verse 27, but I want you to see what comes before that. Verse 24, for Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have often have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 27, you've heard this verse before. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. You've heard that verse, right? Look what, now you know the context. Verse 28, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And what he's saying here is, I mean, this speaks directly against the Catholic doctrine of the Mass. Because he said, as it is appointed, Mike, how many times are you going to die? Once. So then why would we make Christ die multiple times for everybody's sins? When it is only appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. So if God only appoints man to die once, and Christ is that man, therefore Christ only dies once, and he only has to die once. He cannot be re-killed, re-crucified over and over and over again to keep making sacrifices for sin. He doesn't need to. His one death was sufficient. Amen? So, let's say that you came to a place in your life where you said, God, will you save me? God says, yes, I'll save you. And so you go to a church and you say, I've been saved, I'm born again, I asked Jesus in my heart. Well, that's all well and good, but if you want to be part of us, we're going to ask you to get saved again. Would you do it? No, nope, because it makes a mockery of the first time. You're not mocking it. They're wanting, they are demanding that you say you're saved. They won't accept it. So they say, you must get saved again in our presence and in our church or we cannot accept you. Get out of there. You don't need that church. Same way I feel, same way with baptism. 
you've been water baptized by immersion, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and you want to join a church, and they say, well, we need you to be baptized again, don't join. If you didn't think your first baptism was good enough for God, okay, but you do. So who are you trying to please, God or men? Man, and they don't need it. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He's not dying again. He's coming again. Amen? No more sins laid on him. That's over and done with. 